life-changing inventions for brilliant inventors. Their million-dollar ideas will save and take countless lives. A device tested on a dying president, now saving lives at home and on the battlefield. What Bill did was develop a technology that would surround everywhere we are today. A wartime promise that has kept millions of hearts beating. You said, God, you know, if you get me out of this, then you've got my life. A deadly machine gun built to save lives that backfires. The big outing doesn't make war unthinkable, it just makes it much, much more bloody and wild. And the innovation overlooked for 30 years, now transforming the modern world. It's turning imagination into reality, and that feels like science fiction. This is my million dollar invention. Life and death. In the 21st century, there are threats we can't see, hidden beneath layers of clothing. Buried deep in the ground. But one device invented more than 130 years ago can locate these threats before they can kill. The metal detector. A device that has saved millions. Built by a legend and debuted in the White House. We go from finding the bullet in the back of a president to finding landmines in war. It's really quite an amazing journey. 1881. Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station. America's newly elected and 20th president, James A. Garfield, is on his way to an engagement. He's unaware that an assassin, Charles Guiteau, lies in wait. Once Garfield stepped in through the doors of the train station, Couteau followed him. And shot him twice. Once in the right arm, and second, in the right side of his back. Now the one in his arm just grazed him, but the bullet that went through his back actually got stuck inside and lodged. The gunman, Gato, is apprehended as he tries to flee. With Garfield's condition deteriorating, he's moved to the White House. The bullet is lodged somewhere near his spine and vital organs. Doctors are desperate to remove it. But in a time before x-rays, there's no easy way to find it. At the time, there wasn't any antiseptic. There wasn't any, you know, cleaning of surgical tools. One of the first things they did was try to probe into the wound with their fingers without cleaning them, no soap, just going straight in there to try and find the bullet. It only makes the president's condition worse. Pain that Garfield went through with this bullet somewhere in his torso. This guy really suffered a really horrific downward decline. But one man is desperate to come to his president's aid. Well, Alexander Graham Bell was, you know, uh, one of those great American geniuses. In 1881, 34-year-old Bell, flying high with his invention, the telephone, now invents a device that can detect metal. His induction balance machine is supposed to cancel out interference on a telephone line. It consists of two wound coils. One coil creates an electromagnetic field, and the other coil measures the field. But Bell notices that when the device is put close to metal, the metal interacts with the electromagnetic field, and it causes something else to happen.
he found that if metal passed through, you would hear a noise. It means Bell has the potential to locate metal in any given mass. He said, well, why can't I bring this down to Washington and test it on the president? Pass it over his body. I should be able to find the bullet. The White House, July 26th, 1881. Bell's device is the president's last chance for survival. His medical team are skeptical it will work. And they're right. The coils are very sensitive. If any kind of little disturbance is made, you might not be able to cancel out all of the sound. The machine is reacting as if the president is riddled with bullets. To Bell, it makes no sense. And Garfield is fading fast. Fully convinced his equipment is working, and desperate to save his president's life and his own reputation, Bell has a second attempt. But the result is the same. a startling discovery. The president has a coil sprung mattress, a new invention. Barely heard of in 1881, the White House is one of the first to use them. The metal detector wasn't just picking up the, the bullet, it was also picking up every single spring within the mattress. But just as he makes this discovery, Bell is urgently called back home to Boston when his wife goes into labor. Critically, it means he never gets the chance to try again. Eleven weeks after being shot, and only 199 days into his presidential term, Garfield succumbs to infection and the wound in his back. The bullet will later be found lodged behind his pancreas. For Bell, it's disappointing. He knows his device works, but its failure to save the president will torment him for the rest of his life. Garfield's long, slow death at the dirty hands of his doctors could have been avoided. But if Bell thinks his invention will be consigned to the annals of history, He's wrong, because in the 20th century, the detector is going to be reborn and save thousands of lives. The average human heart beats 100,000 times a day in an average 70-year lifetime. That's a massive two and a half billion times. But what happens when a heart doesn't beat like it's supposed to? Once upon a time, the consequences could be fatal. But thanks to a humble radio enthusiast, a matchbox-sized gadget has become one of the most important medical innovations of the 20th century. The pacemaker is now commonplace, but the story behind it is frankly unbelievable. Growing up in the 1920s in Buffalo, New York, Wilson Greatbatch is naturally inquisitive. I think my dad was always an inventor, you know, always tinkering with things. The young Greatbatch finds himself drawn to the world of wireless radio. We would have what they call a crystal radio, and there was only about oh, maybe half a dozen components tree aer aerials or wires to the trees you know, to pick up reception. He could listen to things happening in London and France and Japan and such places. It was just a fascination that there was a device that could be used to communicate all over the world. 
Great Patch's passion for radio lands him a job as a navigator during World War II, flying missions off the USS Monterey. Basic work on all communications between the plane and the ship, and it was constantly improving that and working on that. As the war progresses, Great Batch's missions get deadlier. Losses mount. They lost, I guess, about a third of the squadron you know, during the war. Great Batch starts carrying a Bible on every mission. But on one deadly day in 1943, it isn't enough. Sure that he's going to die, he makes a promise to God. He just said, God, you know, if you get me out of this, you've got my life. I'm giving my life to you. Two years later, when the war ends, Great Batch is one of the lucky ones. Determined to make his life count for something, he vows to dedicate his life to saving others. It's a journey that begins when he obtains a degree from Cornell University in electrical engineering. It's here, in their labs, that he learns of the deadly condition that will define his life's work. Wilson Greenbatch was uh, speaking with uh, physicians and that's where he first learned about the problem of heart block. Heart block affects millions of people around the world. In a normal heart, a cluster of cells called the sinus node, positioned in the right atrium, emits a regular electrical pulse, making the heart beat. Heart block occurs when these pulses are delayed or disrupted. It can mean a person is left short of breath, or worse, the heart rate can, rather than being 60, 70, or 80 beats per minute, it can be a very slow heart rhythm, and the person will pass out. In extreme cases, heart block can lead to death. Great Batch instantly identifies with the problem in radio terms. It's a communication problem, a signal that's not getting through. And the solution? lies in his love of electricity. The thing that fascinated him most about uh, probably electricity in general, you can't see it, you can't feel it, but it's, 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 it's a force and you're able to do things with it. Like kick-starting a heart and saving lives. Next, a lucky mistake sets Great Batch on the path to a life-saving miracle. And another new invention, built to save lives, backfires on its creator. Eighteen sixty-four, the Civil War, with casualties already in the hundreds of thousands, one weapon makes its debut on the battlefield. Its name, the Gatling gun. Its firepower is so devastating. A version of it is still used by global armed forces today. The noise, the, the weight of fire coming around you, it spits death. Yet, unbelievably, the Gatling gun had been invented to bring an end to the war. 1844, St. Louis, Missouri. 26-year-old Richard Gatling works in a dry goods store. The son of a plantation owner and inventor, his every spare minute is spent dreaming up time-saving agricultural devices. Gatling was all as an inventor at heart. He figured that it would be easier to sell more seeds if he had a machine that could plant them quicker and more efficiently. His most successful thing to date was a seed planting device that he'd come up with. As the gravity-fed seed planter moves forward, seeds drop out with regularity and greater precision than could be previously achieved by hand. 
it revolutionizes farming in the South and makes Gatling a small fortune. But just as Gatling's career as an inventor is taking off, he's struck down with smallpox. It's a brush with death that has a profound effect on him. He retrains as a doctor, determined to save lives. But nothing can prepare him for the bloodbath he soon faces. The American Civil War. An event that will inspire Gatling's most famous invention. We're going to see the bloodiest conflict we've ever seen, more so for America than World War II, World War I, and all of our other wars combined. We are going to see over 700,000 deaths in America. Gatling witnesses the horror firsthand. He saw a train arrive with a lot of badly wounded soldiers. Gatling was pretty upset and traumatized by what he saw. It starts Gatling thinking about how to reduce the number of soldiers needed on the battlefield. If we take a look at battle tactics during the American Civil War, really going back to the Napoleonic era and before, we see that it takes thousands of men, multiple ranks deep, to take a single piece of ground. But Gatling's inventive mind sees an answer. What if he could build a single weapon that has the same firepower as a hundred men? Much fewer men on the battlefield, fewer casualties, fewer men taken out of the population to fight a war, and a more effective way to hold the ground. Gatling also hopes the weapon might be so frightening, the trigger might never be pulled. He thought if there was a super weapon that would just cause fear and intimidation in the enemy that they'd just throw down their guns, maybe we could end the war. It's a vision that requires a quantum leap in weapons development. Most guns of the day fire just one or two shots. For Gatling, the solution lies in going back to his previous invention. His seed planter used gravity to sow seeds faster. Now, using gravity and a crank handle, he will sow bullets faster. You now have one gun uh, with six barrels. Gatling's gun has a gravity-fed ammunition system. Bullets are lined up and drop one by one into the firing mechanism as quickly as the operator can crank the handle. As the shooter turns the crank, each barrel fires a bullet. Uh, then moves along, gets reloaded, cools down, and then is ready again to shoot again. Gatling has invented one of the first examples of a machine gun. It's capable of firing at bursts of up to 200 rounds a minute without reloading. You can mow down an entire line of men charging at your position. With the war raging, Gatling secures a patent for what he hopes will be his life-saving machine gun. And he's confident he's got a buyer for the first models. Gatling himself felt that the U.S. Army would accept it immediately. But all his hard work is about to go up in smoke. Sixty years after Alexander Graham Bell invents the first metal detector, the innovation takes its next leap forward. It's called a mine detector, a handheld device first used in World War II to detect Nazi anti-tank mines. The device is so successful, it becomes a standard military tool for decades to come. It will captivate and inspire one man, Charles Garrett, to make the detector the global phenomenon it is today. His story begins in 1955, when he returns home from the Korean War. 
As an electrician in the U.S. Navy, Garrett has come into contact with military-grade detectors. And he thinks he can see a million-dollar idea that will put them in every U.S. household. Treasure hunting, of course, it, uh, it prompted me to build my own metal detector. I knew there were lots of treasure to be found. Using the detectors to hunt for money, not mines, is an idea with the potential to light a fire under a new generation of prospectors. Just the idea of, of discovery. I'm going to see things I can't see by using this disc. When you turn up the soil to see what you find, oh my gosh, it's awesome. Even if all you found was a penny or an old tin can or something like that. To make the detectors user-friendly for civilians, Garrett must first simplify their design. Most contain one or two coils for detecting metal. A larger coil sweeps wider areas faster and allows better detection of larger objects. The small coil can more easily pinpoint very small objects. As the coils operate independently, the operator must manually swap coils to suit their search. Charles had the idea that he could incorporate both size coils into one package and he, he did that and then he put a switch up on the control box. Garrett spends months tinkering on a design that will allow the operator to select the desired coil at the flick of a switch. He becomes so obsessed, his wife Eleanor has to step in. I said, Charles, you've got to quit working on that thing. You stay up half the night, you don't get your rest, we don't get our rest. Either forget about it or put it on the market or do something about it. Well, that started the company right there. Released in 1964 and priced at $145, Garrett's dual search coil hunter will spark a craze. Hello. I'm Charles Garrett, and this is the annual convention of the Prospectors Club of Southern California. Garrett's company becomes one of the largest metal detector manufacturers in the world, catering to an ever-growing legion of hobbyists determined to become the next Indiana Jones. The idea of finding a piece of metal in the ground that can make us rich set the whole country, and in fact the whole world, on fire. This idea of get rich quick. I knew a gentleman, and he found $18,000 worth of silver coins. For every person that finds a rusty nail, there's always that hope to be the one guy who finds the can full of silver dollars. But what starts out as a lucrative hobby is about to turn deadly serious. Next, Garrett reinvents the metal detector to prevent a terrorist outrage. And another new invention breaks the mold to save lives. In 2014, the White House and the Smithsonian Institute come together to produce the highest resolution digital portrait of a president ever created. All thanks to some seemingly futuristic technology that actually got its start over 30 years ago in 1983. The 3D printer. This radical technology has the potential to build almost anything, changing lives around the world. Chuck's invention was the most amazing thing that no one realized they need, but they need it. The story begins in California in 1983. Chuck Hall works at a company that makes resilient synthetic coatings for furniture. But Chuck was a super creative guy. He had just this passion and understanding both chemistry and process and, and mechanics. In the factory, tabletops are coated with a photopolymer acrylic 
which is hardened under ultraviolet light. It's a process that sparks Chuck Hull's million dollar idea. What if, instead of creating one solid layer out of liquid, you create multiple layers that form an object? He looked at these thin layers and he thought to himself, well, if we stack a thousand on top of each other, we can make just about anything. But in order to create a three-dimensional object, Hull needs to experiment with the photopolymer acrylic that makes up these layers. Desperate to develop his idea, Hull approaches his boss. We had a discussion and agreed he would provide a lab, but it would be on my own time. Finally, Hull succeeds in developing a resin strong enough to resist too much warping or a breakage. Now he needs to re-engineer a printer from creating 2D images to a solid 3D object. A leap only made possible when he creates a wireframe computer program. I came up with this idea of the simplest mathematical representation, which was a three-dimensional mesh of a solid object. What's the smallest amount of information that I need that'll do this in a reliable way? And he nailed it. In 1983, Hull builds his first 3D printer. An elevator platform sits in a vat of liquid photopolymer. The computer feeds a wireframe image of the object to be printed in microscopic horizontal layers. An ultraviolet laser traces a cross-section of each layer, solidifying it to the one beneath. Well, after hundreds of layers now, your part's finished and it pops up and you have the complete part. March 9th, 1983. Success. The world's first 3D printed object emerges from Hull's machine. So that's when I called my wife and said, you know, come on down to the lab, you have to see this. She complained she'd already had her pajamas and was going to go to bed. I said, no, no, come on down. This is creating something out of nothing. It's turning imagination into reality, and that feels like science fiction. I gave her this first part, and, and she was very excited as well. Hull patents his stereolithography solid imaging technique and waits for the millions to roll in. But he's in for a shock. In the beginning, nobody really thought much of Chuck Hole's idea. In fact, it took decades for people to really realize the potential of what 3D printing could do. At first, Hull's 3D printer is just too futuristic and expensive. At over $100,000 a unit, investors are scared off, but Hull refuses to give up on his invention. In 1986, he sets up a new company called 3D Systems and secures $5.5 million in investment. And his device comes to the attention of two industries that desperately need his services, car and plane manufacturers. Anytime you're dealing with tiny, obscure parts that may be in short supply or easily lost or easily broken, getting your hands on more of these parts can be a big challenge, and 3D printing, well, it makes it really easy. The high cost of the first 3D printers means that for two decades, few other industries can afford Hull's invention. But in the early 21st century, advances in production drive down costs. Printers costing just a few hundred dollars become available. And suddenly, Hull's space-age creation captures the imagination of the world. But it's in the field of medicine that the 3D printer starts really changing lives. South Sudan, Africa, 2013. A country torn apart by war and littered with bombs and mines. 12-year-old Daniel barely survives an explosion. Daniel lost both of his arms, and he said, if I could have died, I would have. Eating, bathing, going to the restroom, you know, some of the basic needs are, are completely taken away. A 
American innovator Mick Ebling reads about Daniel's story and travels eight and a half thousand miles to help. Ebling isn't a doctor. He's a tech guru from California. Using a 3D printer he's brought with him, he engineers a unique prosthesis for Daniel. Soon Daniel's feeding himself for the first time in two years. That's huge. That's a life or death situation. They're one of the coolest things I've ever witnessed in my life. It was incredible. And Daniel's story might just be the beginning. Bioprinters, capable of printing living tissue, teeth, and bone, are already on the horizon. The ability to create human organs out of living cells, this is really a revolution. Today, the 3D printing business is worth a staggering $3 billion, making 75-year-old inventor Chuck Hull a multimillionaire. And 30 years after he first conceived it, Hull's printer looks set to dominate future science. The potential of this invention to change all of life the way we know it today is very strong. During World War II, Wilson Greatbatch makes a promise to God. Save me and I will make a difference. Now his quest is to overcome a deadly heart condition that creates irregular heartbeats. But he's not the first to try. In 1932, scientists use a hand crank generator to deliver a current to the heart via a needle with little success. The shock had to get through flesh and bone to get to the heart, and this meant that the shock had to be uh, fairly substantial, and this uh, meant a fair amount of pain and discomfort for the patient. External pacemakers aren't much better. There's a famous picture of a patient uh, pushing an external pacemaker that looks as about as big as a television set in front of him. And of course, uh, that patient's uh, world, if you will, was limited by the length of the extension cord because the pacemaker had to be plugged into the wall. A smaller pacemaker, battery powered, and fitted inside the body is clearly the future. The real preference would be to have a totally implantable device so that the patient ha doesn't have to go through that suffering. The challenge for Great Badge is to find the technology that will shrink the device. In 1956, he's working at Buffalo University on a device that records irregular heartbeats. And he stumbles across something that will change the world. He reached into a box of, of resistors and inadvertently picked up a wrong level of resistance. And noticed that instead of a constant signal, uh, this circuit was pulsing. By inserting the wrong sized resistor into his electrical circuit, Great Batch generates a rhythmic electrical beat. This kind of a circuit could give the same signal that the sinus node gives in, in normal healthy people, thus helping someone to have a normal heartbeat. The circuitry used is still too large to fit inside a body. So for two years, Great Batch works on shrinking the design and sealing it so no fluids can leak in or out of the device. When the final prototype is ready, there's only one way to test it. A live subject. They actually were able to connect this device to the heart of a dog and stimulate it to beat. That was the first proof that, that this idea would work. The world's first successful implantable cardiac pacemaker is born. It has the potential to save 10,000 lives a year. But there's a problem. 
power. The batteries made the pacemaker possible, but they had uh, certain drawbacks, uh, among which was they didn't make very high voltage, so you needed as many as 10 batteries inside a device. The latest rechargeable battery doesn't last long enough. It gave no warning that it was going to stop. It just stopped. He was convinced that there had to be a better battery out there. It's a challenge, which is going to result in Great Batch discovering his second million dollar invention. December 1862, Dr. Richard Gatling has designed the first practical machine gun. He thinks it will prove so devastating, it will end the ongoing civil war. But a disaster is about to rob him of his dream. A fire that destroys the factory, all his technical drawings, and his first six prototypes. It takes Gatling months to rebuild his operation. And all the time, more men are dying on U.S. battlefields. Finally, in 1864, 12 Gatlings make their debut. Paid for by the Union Army, they are deployed in the Siege of Petersburg. Gatling himself is sure they will prove devastating. But a crucial flaw in their design means they barely fire a round. The original gun fired a paper cartridge which was preloaded into a cylinder. They were fed into the gun and would drop into place like this. The problem with this method was you could never have an identical fit on each shell. Therefore, they were shaving in the bullet when it came out of the cylinder and there were gas leaks which fouled the gun itself. These problems see Gatling turn instead to another innovation of the day, metal cartridges. They're uniform in size and shape. Once in the chamber, it was totally enclosed by the barrel, so when it exploded, the bullet had nowhere to go except straight down the barrel. is reliable and lethally devastating. In 1866, the army buys 100 guns, but it comes too late to influence the war for which it was built. The surrender by the South means the Gatling gun has to wait. Three decades pass until the 1890s when it's deployed during the Spanish-American War, terrifying the enemy. That's the first effective machine that we're going to see on the battlefields of the world. Psychologically, the machine gun has a massive impact on the person that's being fired at. Two men working a machine gun can now, in the space of a very short period of time, kill hundreds and hundreds of men. The Gatling is used as far afield as Africa and Asia becoming the tool of colonization, helping Europeans massacre local forces. It is a scary thing being shot at by a machine gun. It, it spits death. But Gatling's stated goal, the creation of a weapon that would save lives and end wars, is never fulfilled. Instead, his machine gun paves the way for the greatest loss of human life ever witnessed. The great irony is that the Gatling doesn't make war unthinkable, it just makes it much, much more bloody and violent. In his lifetime, Gatling makes no comment on the horror his weapon causes. But he does sell the rights to firearms giant Colt, and dies a millionaire. It's an act that leads to an accusation that Gatling spun a story of saving lives to cash in on death. This idea that you can create a weapon that, that makes war 
clean and fast and efficient is one that, that designers of aircraft or smart bombs still sell to politicians to this day. It's something that people want to hear. So if you tell people what they want to hear, they might be more likely to buy your stuff. In the early 20th century, the introduction of lighter, more powerful machine guns renders Gatling's design obsolete. But his gun will stage an unlikely comeback. When a simple new design engineers it into the most feared weapon on the modern battlefield. Charles Garrett has been producing commercial metal detectors for hobbyists for 20 years. Now he's given a new challenge. The 1984 Olympics are due to be held in Los Angeles, and organizers are afraid of terrorism. There was a period when it appeared that there was a hijacking almost every day, and governments were terrified. So the Los Angeles Olympic Committee contact Garrett and ask him to re-engineer his detector technology to create an airport scanning device. They came to Charles and asked him could he make a walkthrough, and he said he could try. It was a very easy transition to scale the metal detection up to an um, archway type size. In April 1984, officials approved the new scanner for use in the 1984 Olympics, and the games go ahead without incident. Modern airport scanners changed the game when it came to terrorism. It didn't make it impossible to hijack planes and plant bombs, but it did make it a whole lot harder. Today, Garrett's company is the global leader of walkthrough and handheld detection products. We interact with metal detectors more than I think we can imagine. We go through metal detectors to get on airplanes, to go to tourist spots, to even in some places going to school. Metal detectors are everywhere. And now, they're helping military personnel in their fight against a new threat thousands of miles from home. In the 21st century, the improvised explosive device has become a terrifying weapon. Think of Iraq, think of Afghanistan. Modern coalition forces have faced the threat of hidden IEDs on a daily basis. But one piece of equipment has saved soldiers' lives time and again. The metal detector. The soil over there is so saturated with metal from years of warfare, but you can really pick out the difference between a piece of steel from a bomb that exploded 40 years ago and a 9-volt battery. More than 130 years after Alexander Graham Bell first used the technology to try to save a president's life, the metal detector is successfully saving thousands of lives day after day. In the 1860s, Dr. Richard Gatling's machine gun is the most devastating weapon yet created. But it's superseded in World War I by lighter designs and is mothballed for over 40 years. Then, in the jet age, everything changes. When fighter aircraft went from two to three hundred miles an hour to over a thousand miles an hour, it became obvious that a new weapon was going to be needed that was far more effective than a 50 caliber machine gun. Single barrel weapons can't fire fast enough and overheat during prolonged fire. So the U.S. Army searches for a rapid fire weapon that can do the job. They looked at a number of them and ironically went back to the Gatling gun system. Crucially, Engineers make one simple but deadly alteration. They add an electric motor. Now rotated faster than any hand could, it fires 3,000 rounds per minute. And its six-barreled mechanism 
allows barrels to cool between shots. Today, it's still one of the most feared weapons on the battlefield. An ironic legacy for Gatling, the man who thought this gun would end all wars. A machine gun has defined the modern battlefield. Its impact is as significant as air power. It's 1960, and four years after conceiving his pacemaker device, Wilson Greatbatch stands on the verge of the first human trial. If it works, millions of people suffering from heart block stand to benefit. The pacemaker, powered by a mercury battery, is implanted into Frank Hennefeld, a 77-year-old patient. The longest any other implantable pacemaker has lasted is six weeks. Great Batch's patient lives for three weeks, eight weeks, a year. The new electric pacemaker is a success, but there's still one last hurdle to overcome. Battery life. The lifespan of mercury-based cells is just too short. Great Batch doesn't want patients opened up time and again just to change batteries. So Great Batch adapts a new technology, lithium cells. The batteries he engineers are smaller, last longer, and are less toxic allowing patients to live for up to 10 years before a replacement is needed. An advance that means it's his technology that powers the pacemakers in some 3 million patients. The pacemaker made him a millionaire, and then the battery did more than that. Today, modern pacemakers take just 45 minutes to implant and deliver 420 million heartbeats over a 10-year lifespan. And when its inventor Wilson Greatbatch passes away, he dies knowing that he kept his promise to God. He has a legacy of inventing a device that has saved millions of lives, that has led the development of these other devices that help human heart. You know, my dad's one of the pacemaker. I'm very proud of that. Four life and death inventions have changed the world. Repairing shattered lives. Detect